りおしまい。Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Get the Mic, the only show where your host on the left, Owl, and your host on the right, Brock, dissect fiction for its mythological significance. In this episode, as usual, we're talking about Dragon Ball, and in particular, Dragon Ball episode 95, which is called Goku vs. Krillin. I think basically in both. Uh, It's just called Goku vs. Krillin, because that's what it is, even though that hardly happens in this episode. I think there's a more important purpose to the episode, but Goku vs. Krillin! Go, Let's go, boys! Gomu vs. Krillin. So, uh, before we get started, though, as usual, if you like what you hear in this episode, please give us a like, subscribe. We upload new episodes on Mondays and Thursdays, and on Rumble, Tuesdays and Fridays. Give us a scrungle over there. We'd love to hear what you guys have to say in the comments, whether you agree or disagree. And... I think without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get straight into the episode. So in the aftermath of the match between Tien and Jackie Chun, the latter walks away from the crowd, refusing to give any indication of why he did what he did, that being forfeit the match. The Crane Hermit is excited, stroking Tien's ego by stating that Jackie was scared of losing and therefore he threw the match. Tien, however, goes on a walk in conflict with himself about Jackie's surrender, thinking that why would somebody who respects the hierarchy so much disrespect the hierarchy by forfeiting the match? And he goes over and he punches some barrels uh, and out streams this water, and I think that's that's very important symbology for what's going on. But to start at the beginning, I also want to mention uh, Jackie Chun walking from the crowd there's a, a little girl who's crying because someone's standing on her dress and Jackie Chun helps her out and like smiles at her, makes her smile. And that's the last time we see Jackie Chun in all of it. He, this is, this is the putting away of the integration that Roshi's able to achieve by instantiating himself in the world such that he was with Jackie Chun. And so it's kind of a sad thing because we understand that that spirit of Jackie Chun the, the knowledge that he brought uh, not only to our main characters, but the enlightenment that he brought to other people, how he saved everyone in the last tournament. Um, all of that stuff is kind of put away and compartmentalized. And his status as sort of a, a point to orient yourself toward, right? Because he recognizes that there's a mode of being better for people to idolize as the stars to orient yourself toward, right and right? that's kind of where i was getting at because at the end here he makes that little girl smile and it's to say that this spirit has brought joy and goodness into the world 
and now it needs to be put away because things are about to get worse. Yeah. And so he walks he walks away and that's the last we see of him and meanwhile uh all of the people are around Tien asking him about his victory and like I said the crane hermit is excited to tell Tien what he thinks he should hear. And this is the Which first Tien won't listen to it. He knows better al- uh, already because he knows that he's sort of beyond the crane hermit in a sense. Right. I was going to say it, it's the, it's the crane hermit trying to keep Tien like Chaozu ignorant of of the real world and only possessed of this one mode of being which is what we were saying earlier that if i'm a hair better than you then that's my identity right and and i'll edge out a victory even if it's not fair or if it's you know whatever will keep me in that status being ahead of you right the principle of just being better than you right and we also see here too uh, a lot of the memories that tn has of the fight are Jackie smiling at him? It's a very open and um, honest conceptualization of what Jackie is supposed to be. And where it's clear to the audience that TN is conflicted because he knows that Jackie is a good person and that that is something that he should try to be, but he is not. And so what does he do? He goes over to these barrels and breaks them and out spills the water of renewal. Right, he lashes out in his sort of darkest hour against the world, against his surroundings, but specifically he hits the barrels, and the world responds by giving him that sort of rejuvenating water, right? The wisdom. And so he, and we're going to see in the next scene, uh, he is on a path now to that is superseding the Crane Hermit. Meanwhile, though, Goku and Krillin, are, their fight is announced, and as their match is about to begin, we see that the Go crew is conflicted on who to root for. Launch says that it's obviously going to be Goku who wins. After all, he defeated the entire Red Ribbon Army. Not a bad point. Uh, and Krillin, meanwhile, tells Goku that if he holds back, then Krillin will hate him forever. A line that's lost in the English dub. It's so lost. What does he say in the English job? He's like, promise me that you won't treat me like I'm a friend. You'll treat me like a fighter. Like you'll treat me like a real enemy or a fighter. Yeah. Right? But this is this is way different than that. And it's to say that if Goku isn't going to instantiate himself fully in the endeavor of grappling with the unknown that Krillin brings to the table and Krillin's identity and having that almost divine dance that, that that these characters go through every time they enter the ring here in the Budokai, if he doesn't commit himself fully to that, then Krillin will consider it an act of betrayal, right? Because he's not... Goku wouldn't be him his true self, let's say. Well, also, again, this is the understanding that they have, that the both of them have, that you have to contend with the world as it is and not a safe version of it. You know, they're starting to intuit this idea that it has to be dangerous, that it has to be really chaotic and the, real. Yeah. It has to be an authentic experience of something you can take into the world for it to be nourishing in this hierarchy. It's almost the idea, right? Would, would, uh, which is more spiritually fulfilling trying and failing at an endeavor or, having training wheels in that endeavor and succeeding only because of them. Which is more spiritually fulfilling? Having a California boxing instructor help you three hours a week or flying out to Rhode Island so a meme lord can teach you on the streets of, uh, or in the parking lot of a shady motel. That's excellent example and pertinent to the time, right? Because one of them is a spiritual pilgrimage and the other one is, is... uh, doing the actions that are deemed necessary without the spiritual act, at, the spiritual aspect to it. Right. One is inward and one is outward, right? Right. And so Krillin wants them to bring their full weight of their, their being against each other so that they can, it can be an honest match. Right. And it, it's to show, and this is going to get in the start of us gushing about Krillin for the next two episodes, basically, because it's to ensure that 
uh, Krillin has changed as a character. Who? Wh- what do we see Krillin do first is lie to Roshi. Right? He lies to Roshi. He tries to tell Goku not to rescue Launch. He lies about the stone. He steals the stone from, from Goku. He, he has no value for integrity whatsoever. And then his failure in the blue arc, where he's unable to withstand blue, right? That's another level uh, that we see Krillin fail at that he, he tries to work towards. Well, so, so there's one thing I want to point out about this is the fighting gi, right? So they're both fighting with Roshi's gi still, right? I think that Goku has mastered um, what that means. And what I mean by that is to wear the symbol of something. It's to say that you're trying to emulate the best version of the representation of that idea, right? You're trying to live up to the uniform. You're trying to dress for the job you want, in a sense, right? You're trying to say that you're larger than you really are by um, having your outer representation symbolic, right? And so that's what Krillin is still trying to live up to what Roshi represents. Sure, but what I mean is that the the I, I was just going through the things that Krillin has gone through that have yeah. he's failed at, that he's overcome at this point. So, like, the, the idea of the tyrannical order Krillin has has a conceptualization of by encountering blue. And then his failure at Baba's was a lack of honest con- confrontation of the task at hand, right? It was the adoption of arrogance, which is immediately beaten out of him by being on the path alongside with Goku. And so now he's kind of understood that that's the ultimate subordination is to the truth, to integrity. Right, and that's why I wanted to point out the uniform is that subordination. Yes. And so by him doing that and by him honestly trying to embody the the turtle hermit as much as possible and we see even even in his flashbacks to his training um he wants the same from Goku and even if he loses he understands now that he's playing a game of games and that even if he loses the knowledge that he'll take away from win. it if it's integral right if it's integrated yeah. properly if if Goku doesn't give his all, then Krillin can't learn all that he can from Goku. Exactly. The win here is that he gets to participate with Goku. Because even if he loses to him, he'll be enlightened. And he knows now, because he's he's aligned himself with the spirit of the Turtle Hermit, that that is a win and anyway. It is, it, it, and it, so he implores him to be honest with him, right? It's a divine idea, right? It's almost like they're both walking in a divine path together. And they both will learn as a result if they both follow the the integrity that's before them. Exactly. And so... It's dialogical, you could yeah. say. Yes, but it's physical. It's in a physical yeah. medium, which is the whole shonen part of it. But this... I, I don't think this... But the dichotomy between Goku and Krillin is that sort of dialogical mm-hmm. play, which it's... You know, the relationship between Goku and Krillin, I mean, it goes all the way down to the bottom of Goku's being, which we're going to see all the way through the end of what we talk about in Z as well, right? He's so and in the integrated. Next few episodes. He's so integrated into who Goku is and what his potential, what lies sort of on the edge of knowing what his potential is. It's sort of well, it's very it, it's tied almost, into that. It's almost Goku's first disciple, more or less, right? It's a reflection of, of what Goku is embodying at the time. And how Krillin has grown at this point is something that Goku can be proud and respectful of. And so that when they square off finally, um, they're both they're both ready to go at it and learn from each other and have that dialectic that we were talking about. And that's that is that cy- I mean, it's a spiritual cycle because there is that understanding that there's always an interplay between the top and the bottom. Between where the the wisdom that Goku has in his mode of being feeds into Krillin's wisdom, but what Krillin understands by the virtue of being someone to learn from Goku has wisdom that Goku needs to gain as well. And, and there's an infinite and things like that, yeah. And so the existence of two creates an interchange where the cycle from top to bottom and bottom to top has to be sort of Refreshed rotated from through. time to time. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. an eternal cycle, and it's the it's not something that like Goku couldn't 
Goku couldn't be the number one under the heavens without having that interchange and to be rejuvenated by that wisdom. Honestly, right? Because Definitely. that's what is needed to be in that position. And so this is sort of a holy interplay, like you were saying, that they're engaging with here. It's also the fruits of, of Goku's uh, spiritual mentorship to, to uh, Krillin. It's uh, a testament to, to, to that and uh, Roshi's um, paternal influence on them as well, that Krillin would ask Goku not to hold back um, and that if he does, he'll hate him forever. And so as they enter the ring, that Krillin thinks about his training and says that he's finally ready to fight, that he can do this. He says that to himself three times. And it's pretty convincing that he um, he's proud of the work he's done and he's ready to see how far uh, it will take him. And so, outside of the event, Roshi changes out of his Jackie Chun disguise for the last time. Tien, however, approaches and Roshi engages him in conversation. At first, Roshi disarms Tien by sneezing and handing the tissue to the used tissue to him, telling him to throw it away. With the boys fighting as the backdrop to this important discussion, Roshi reveals why he entered the tournament to begin with, that his students needed to not have an upper limit that could be attained easily. Further, Tian boasts that he is more than a match for Roshi's students. After all, Roshi quit after learning of his amazing strength. But Roshi mentions that the road ahead is for all the young warriors attending the Budokai. This alarms Tian, making him state that he will be like Tao and revel in the screams and suffering of others. But Roshi does not believe him. And that unnerves him more than anything else. Yeah, it's interesting, first off, that um, he, when he gives him the tissue, it's in response to being questioned. He, I think it's when he really confronts him and asks him, why did you do what you did? And, and puts him on the spot. And he's trying to, trying to find exactly the wording that he uses, because I think in the Japanese, it's really a poignant to what's going on here which is that the the lesson that um that jackie chun is trying to teach him or that roshi now is trying to teach him is that he needs to be able to ultimately subordinate himself to some type of spiritual father regardless of who it is the concept of doing it is important enough for him to do it and so everything that he does is sort of like will you sacrifice some of your pride to subordinate yourself to an elder you know, and time and time again, he won't do it, right? He throws it down. And he says, I'm tired of your nonsense. Let me see. What does he say to him? Did you lose on purpose because you had the Jackie mask on? The real Roshi wouldn't have done it. And then Roshi sneezes and he gives him that. And he says, would you throw that away for me? Right. And it, it it's a whole, the whole thing is disarming Tien because he's so focused on the, the hierarchy that exists in front of him that he can't understand the game of games that's being played by Roshi to set up his students for success. He's he's powerful. He has integrated a lot of things within his own being, Tien that is. But he can't comprehend the way that Roshi's acting because Roshi is truly a good actor in the world. And so when he's questioned about the his motives, let's say, what does he reveal but his own, let's say, fallibility and embarrassment? And he says here, this, can you is, hide this, for this me? is my weakness. Can you dispose of it properly? Yeah. In fact, he, he kind of does the same thing that he did in the last episode. Exactly. But symbolically, because in the last episode, he says, uh, after Crane Hermit points him out, he says, can you hide this secret for me? Uh because of my students. Right. Can you stop using your third eye to point out the nakedness of the father? Can you instead use it to preserve the image of the father? Mm -hmm. He keeps giving him that opportunity because that is the next step for him. Right. Right. And so and now his does... path has transcended the Budokai tournament. Right. It's it's taken off and, and such that we're going to start seeing some big changes in TN very shortly. And so... While that's happening, though, we see the boys fighting in the background and the fruits of the mentorship that Roshi has provided them and how they are both competent martial artists in their own right and that his 
age and his time in this story is coming to a close, all of those aspects are kind of embodied within this discussion and in the backdrop of it. And it's, it's a really good scene because the sun's going down as well, right? The, the once preserving order of the world is being submerged behind the earth and will come again in the next day. But it's really, it's a very symbolic scene too uh, because of that setting, the tissue, him walking away, right? The body language of Roshi too is nothing that's, alarmed or threatened by Tien whatsoever, even though Tien wishes himself to be perceived as such. And so when Roshi reveals why he entered the tournament, he says that it was so that his students wouldn't be, wouldn't think that they have nothing left to learn, basically. And so when he says this to Tien, Tien says, so I'm strong enough to defeat them, obviously. That's why you were okay stepping down, and I would have defeated you too. And Roshi just responds by saying that the road ahead is for all the young warriors. And Tien's kind of caught, caught off guard by that. He says, young warriors, question mark. Like, he's part of that. He's part of something greater and good that's outside of himself. Right, Roshi is... I mean, he's basically letting him know that they're not having the same conversation. He's talking about the road ahead yes. for warriors, not just for the hypothetical fight, but for the real fight. The time for the real fight has come. The world is ready now, right? It, or you could say the new guard is ready. that's why the ready. sun is setting, right. Yeah. yeah. And so he, he, as a judge, has judged that there, are, there is sufficient positive karma in the world you could say and potential to deal with mm -hmm. the responsibility of the world and so he's telling Tien you're part of that like my fight with you convinced me that now the road ahead is harsh and it's for you guys it's like the the distance that you've gone with your sight and the way that you can integrate the wisdom that is even difficult for the father to integrate means that you're that rejuvenating force. Like you're part of you're it. You're a signal least, yeah. of the maturity of the world to defend itself against malice. Right. And it's interesting too because this is this is where the the show itself starts to go in a more mature direction. Yeah. This episode I would say is really, really this the last episode and this episode are really where it starts. I mean, I don't think we've ever seen as visceral of combat as last episode where Tien is like choking Roshi out and he like cannot breathe. And then you know in the scope of Dragon Ball it's not even memorable whenever it comes to visceral violence in the show. So we're about to get really serious. Yeah. It's all gas from here. From this episode on. Oh yeah, it's gonna be great. And so um, the last thing that alarms Tien is that him not believing Tien when Tien says that he's gonna be just like Tao. And it's because Roshi already knows that Tien is, is past Tao. It's something that Tien hasn't had to confront yet, mainly because he hasn't encountered Tao in a, in a long time, right? So it's revealed to us that he hasn't seen him over the years since, you know, since Goku had dealt with him. And so there's this question that's kind of posed early here where what's the path going to be for Tien? essentially is what the question is. Where are you going to go? Are you going to be like Mercenary Tao? Are you going to be like the Crane Hermit? It's the question that's being posed to him by the Turtle Hermit, right? Saying, mm -hmm. what's but it going to be? What are you orienting yourself to? It's more toward? of a rhetorical question because Roshi already knows that he is a good person at heart. Right. And that he, he even says he doesn't see him becoming a villain because otherwise he wouldn't have sought out Roshi's wisdom to begin with. He would have listened to Crane and said, you're right, that old man, that old geezer lost. You wouldn't be here right now if you truly had no seed of good. And Roshi already knew that before he, before he stepped out of the ring. Otherwise, he wouldn't have. Right, that's why, specifically, I felt like it was significant that the headbutting scene and the, yes. the, the damage sustained to the, the forehead in the same spot for Jackie Chun, right? It's sort That's of that saying. It gave coming him to that see him idea, gains yeah. that sight. It's beaten into him by the fact that Tien is able to manipulate the match in the way he is. 
he's able to, right? Mm-hmm. And so that conversation is is concluded with um Tien kind of standing there aghast. He doesn't he has no more words to say to Roshi other than I'll prove you I'll prove that I'm a villain in the last match. And so we'll see. <laughs> and Roshi, of course, is like, we'll see about that. Yeah, we'll see about that. And so meanwhile, back in the ring, the match continues between Goku and Krillin. And each of them are impressing each other. After chasing Goku into the air, Krillin kicks him down to the ground, only for Goku to land easily. Krillin then uses his breath to dodge the counter attack that Goku tries, and they both exclaim their excitement as the episode concludes, leading us into the conclusion of their match next episode. So, pretty obvious. I like that you pointed out the, the breath technique that Krillin is able to use. I think that's like the most obvious thing that's going on in this part, right? Yes. It's really the only thing worth mentioning. I, I want to point out that it's an inversion of what Goku did, right? Yes. So Goku, at the last second, breathed out. Right. And he, he sent his spirit out of himself to control his position uh, in the hierarchy. It's his, his height, right? He controls it with his breath. Whereas Krillin subsumes a bunch of air. Which is what he's been doing, training with Roshi, right? Right, yeah, yeah. Instead of going out and projecting himself into the world, he's, he's focused inward. He's become very strong at taking in the wisdom of Roshi, so much so that it protects him. And so it slows his fall, and he's able to dodge Goku's kick. Now, one interesting thing is that I didn't write down was uh, the reason that Krillin's able to kick Goku down to the ground is because his head blinds Goku for a second. Mm, that's right. And it, it's almost accidental, but at the same time, we've seen um, we've seen Krillin's head be shiny with the moon episode, with the full moon vengeance and things like that. Um, but it's not something okay. Krillin intentionally does. But what is the moon but a satellite that reflects the light of the sun, right? Right. And what is Krillin's head? And we've seen it portrayed as the moon, but this satellite that reflects the wisdom of the spiritual father, of the sun, right? That could blind Goku. And that's what he's been focusing. Well, not blind Goku, but not blind, show Goku's but... blindness. Like it, yeah. Th- and, and that's Make what him it... experience the existence of his blindness. rather than The existence of his that. flaws, right, yeah. exactly. And so for a second there, he's like, whoa. Krillin's... But that's the brightness of Krillin's mode of being. Krillin's taking channeling. in yeah, yeah. the wisdom of Roshi for all of this time that Goku's been out. Krillin's channeling Roshi. I haven't been around Roshi in a while. My flaws yeah. haven't been pointed out to me. Like, boom, right there. And then he's able to kick him to the ground. But as we know, that's only beneficial to Goku. Goku kind of thrives on that kind of knowledge. So he's not. He's, he's not like, awesome, cool. Anything. Let's go. He is excited by it, though. Uh, and on, one other thing in the beginning, um, Goku tries to use the after image technique to, to get Krillin. And Krillin uses it against Goku. And they're they're both kind of uh, impressed with each other with that exchange. Now, I think it's important here because last time we saw Krillin fight Chaozu, which is whatever, right? It wasn't a very um technical fight as much as it was defeating the idea that Chaozu represented. Here we see the one of the first things Krillin does is use the technique that got him out last time to begin with. Because what did Roshi use to get Krillin out? The after image and chopped his neck, remember, in the last tournament. Ah, that's right. And so the first thing when Krillin has a real fight here with Goku, that's not not full of gimmicks or uh, certain techniques that are challenging for that reason, like the Dodon Ray. The first thing we see is his use of the projected image, the after image technique, where he tricks Goku here and he's no longer susceptible to that attack. Yes. And it's it's always like we have a certain and you know people complain about this about Dragon Ball but there's ground you need to tread to establish the spiritual power level of your characters, right? Without so, having a scouter or his powers beyond my mind. Right. And so it's it's more explicit in Dragon Ball and then there's they still do it even whenever there's scouters in Z, right? Where we have these phases of leveling up or of power increases, and it seems arbitrary, and it's like, 
It's just Goku powering up for a whole episode. But there is a scaling of this fight that you can see that they try to sort of shortcut later on in the series, right? Yes, exactly. Well, they kind of... Uh, I don't know if it's a shortcut because they, they do still... They just em- don't need to say the same thing a they thousand times They do embody it, like you're saying. Yeah. But the idea of introducing, like, the actual numbers, numerical values and stuff, it's But almost, there's an idea of, it's like... It's, like, shorthand, almost. Right, but there's an idea, right, of Krillin powering up past all of the wisdom that's representative of, in this fight before they get to the very end, right? Mm-hmm. And you can say, like, here's point A and point B, and there's a bunch of different segments between this this whole fight. And so they kind of shortcut through the idea of what it means to be on a certain power level, quote unquote, right? But what Dragon Ball is so great at is establishing what that progression is. So whenever you're in Z and you have an understanding of what that progression would be and what it means to be on certain levels, you don't need to be told a thousand times. It's over. true, but it's it's very important to say that having the basis and the the knowledge of Dragon Ball, the basis of that context is it it's really eye opening to give you what Z is supposed to be, which we'll get to very soon. Yeah, it becomes clear whenever you Much more just clear, follow yeah. the train of thought. But but I I just think it's interesting because we should know this in a sense, but you know, we haven't seen Krillin fight. But we're we're seeing, you know, we're being shown that progression of, of Krillin spirit that is available to you as long as you're willing to subordinate yourself to the spiritual father as sort of a even if focus. that's all you do, even if that's all you ever do, right? There's it's still this is worthy. This, there's this amount of wisdom that you can take from it, and right. it's a worthy endeavor, right? Mm-hmm. And so that kind of brings us to the end. I think we talked about each each piece of that already. So, yeah, the real bulk of the Goku versus Krillin fight is next time. A tale's tale, I believe it's called. So, uh, if you guys like what you heard, unless you have anything else, Brock. No, I think that's it. Okay. If you guys like what you heard, please give us a like, subscribe. We upload new episodes Mondays and Thursdays to YouTube, Tuesdays and Fridays to Rumble. Give us a subscrungle over there as well. Uh, If you want to leave a comment, we'd love to hear what you have to say, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether you disagree, whether you agree. Please feel free to type into that little box below. Other than that, uh, I'm your host on the left, Owl. I'm your host on the right, Brock. And we hope you guys enjoyed the episode and have a good rest of your night.